Good morning. Welcome to Winchester Cathedral. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, you're all very, very welcome. We now call this Sunday the second Sunday of Easter. Uh, that's also low Sunday. It's also a chance for my colleagues to go away on a well-deserved break. I will deserve one eventually. But it's lovely to see you all here today. And we're very pleased that the choir of Godalming Minster are singing our worship all day. And that includes the 3.30 festal evensong on the eve of the Annunciation. So please do come to that service as well if you can. After this service, we have coffee in the north transept. For those who are in the building, it's over there. Please do join us, especially if you're a new person to us. Uh, we'd love to get to know you. Uh, the coming week, it's evening prayer rather than evensong from Monday to Friday. On Saturday, it will be choral evensong again, sung by the new Gloriana Choir, as indeed Sunday services will be. Uh, you'll find the details in Community News, which is a double edition from Easter Sunday. Today's service details on the inside of the back page. I think that's all there is to be said. We'll just have a few moments' silence before the service begins. Thank you all and God bless you. Our first hymn is number 107, if you'd like to look at her.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Let us therefore rejoice by putting away all malice and evil and confessing our sins with a sincere and true heart. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth. Through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Chapter 4. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. But everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they had sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. When it was evening on the first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came 
and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I always rather feel sorry for Thomas. He's got quite a bad rap. He's gone down in history as doubting Thomas. And yet, that never seems quite a fair description to me. I think he probably reacted just about the same that many of us would do, given similar circumstances. Missing out is never easy. Whether it's by accident, something just happens when you're not around, or by design, when we're deliberately excluded for some reason. And Thomas must have felt a bit like he'd missed out, when he heard the other disciples had seen and talked with Jesus. They'd been in the room, they'd seen his wounds, they'd spoken with him, he'd blessed them and breathed the Spirit on them. It's quite a big thing to miss out on. And Thomas wasn't there, we're not told why. 
And so when they got together again, you can start to imagine the conflict of emotions that he had, the unfairness of it all. Why did he just go off to the market at that particular time of the day? Why me? Why did I miss out? Why am I the last to know anything around here? They're all very familiar emotions. And we can almost just hear him snap. Unless I see him and his wounds, I won't believe. I don't think, though, that that is the voice of a doubter. It's the voice of someone who perhaps feels left out, vulnerable, and on the edge, but who is genuinely seeking to know and to understand for himself. He wants to stand on his own two feet. When my children were tiny and not yet walking, but wanting to, I used to put their feet on mine and hold them by the hands and the arms and walk around with them. And they felt like they were walking, that they were doing it by themselves. It gave them a sense of fun and the experience and perspective of what it would be like to walk. But really and truly, they weren't walking. I was. They weren't able to walk yet, and so they relied on me to do it for them. But if I'd carried on doing that past the time when they were strong enough to walk by themselves, they'd have still got around. They'd have still seen things from the same perspective, but they literally wouldn't be learning to stand on their own two feet. It wasn't going to be great for their development or ultimately their sense of achievement or growth. The idea of doing that with my six foot two 19 year old rather um, frightens me. <laughs> Might be the other way around, to be honest. In our gospel reading, Thomas is clearly not wanting to be carried along by others. He wants to know and experience exactly what they have, not because he's doubting, but because he absolutely doesn't want to. And Jesus knows this. And when he comes to the disciples again, he goes straight to Thomas and shows him his wounds, shows him exactly what he needed to see and wanted to touch. Thomas needed to be drawn back into the group again, to have the same experience as the others, to feel that he was standing on his own two feet when it came to faith and an experience of the risen Christ. And by coming to him specifically, Jesus enables that. He knows what Thomas needs and he gives that to him. He brings him back into the group, into the community with all their shared experience and understanding. Now, as we hear the story of Thomas, I'm sure we can recollect times when we, each of us, have felt on the edge of something, feel like we've missed out, that we're not quite part of it. And we will also be aware in group settings where there are others who feel this way. Part of building the kingdom of God is about drawing people in, including those who feel they are on the edges for whatever reason bringing them in to be a full part of the community. We are called to enable others to experience the reality of the risen Jesus, not just stories and hearsay and secondhand, but immediate, personal and real for themselves. We're called to address the needs such as Thomas had, meeting people where they are as Jesus did with him. The story of Thomas says something else to us too. It reminds us that we are all physical human beings. The resurrection itself it emphasizes this. Body and spirit are both important. Greek philosophy held that the body wasn't a priority. It was a hindrance, something that got in the way of true spirituality. But by rising again in bodily form, Jesus showed that that wasn't true in God's way of thinking. If the physical side of our life is not important, why did we, why do we need a bodily resurrection? And yet here we have Jesus living once more in a resurrection body, a physical, touchable body. 
He knew before he died that this connection with the physical was important. His followers needed tangible things. At the Passover meal, itself a physical reminder of something that happened centuries before, Jesus instituted communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, the Mass, whatever name we want to give it. He gave his followers something real, physical and tangible to use and work with, to remember and to feed on, externally and internally. The classic definition of a sacrament is the visible sign of invisible grace. It's more than just a symbol. It conveys on the outside something of what is going on inside. When Thomas touched Jesus, it was seeing and feeling his master that helped him believe. It cemented in him something that was internal. It made what he believed real and grounded it. It was proof, but also something more. The Eucharist is a reminder that our faith is grounded in the physical, in the incarnate and resurrected body of Christ. It is faith creating and faith building. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church who started his ministry as an Anglican priest, believed that the Eucharist was what he described as a converting ordinance. In other words, it created faith. It was an encounter in the physical elements with the risen Christ that birthed faith in people, rather like Thomas's own physical encounter with the risen Jesus. Something visible and tangible on the outside triggered and fed something internal, something spiritual. And the Eucharist is also about community. We've said Thomas felt left out. He felt excluded, marginalized even, until he encountered the risen Christ for himself and was drawn back into the community of the disciples. When we eat together and encounter the risen Jesus, we draw each other back into community. We say, though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. And when we invite others to this table, we draw them into and offer the chance for faith to grow in them and for them to be part of our community of faith. Like Thomas, we need something physical because we are physical beings. And in the risen Christ, we see confirmation that our physical natures are celebrated and affirmed. We see community and inclusion made central to our common life. And in the Eucharist that we celebrate now, we bring these things together and we remember and we rejoice. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia.
In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. In this season of Easter, we give thanks for the promise of eternal life revealed to us through the risen Christ. We remember all those who have put their own lives at risk in order to help those in need. And we remember all those who have been killed in the pursuit of justice. Lord, in your mercy, We pray for world leaders, both those we support and those we do not, that they may lead us all in peace with justice. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for our cathedral community, for our staff, volunteers, congregation, and visitors. We give thanks for those around us, family, friends, those we work with, perhaps naming in our hearts someone who has been particularly kind to us this week. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the recently departed. We extend our love to those who have asked for our prayers and we hold in our hearts those known to us who have gone. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lastly, we pray for ourselves. We pray that you would grant us joy, openness, inclusivity, spiritual refreshment, and gratitude. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. I'll offer to him number 351.
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, almighty and eternal Father. And in these days of Easter, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of your wonderful works. For by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and hell and restored in men and women the image of your glory. He has placed them once more in paradise and opened to them the gate of life eternal. And so, in the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and the powers of all creation sing forever the hymn of your glory. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Swithin, and all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. You are accustomed to receiving communion in your own church of whatever denomination you are welcome to receive here. If you would prefer not to receive bread and wine, then do come for a blessing, bring a service sheet with you or keep your hands folded across the front of you. 
um, and there are gluten-free wafers available and they will be at the front here.
Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, through our Saviour, Jesus Christ, you have assured your children of eternal life and in baptism have made us one with him. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in your love, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand for our final hymn, number 105. Day, both in the cathedral and especially um, a welcome and thank you to those who are online and for those online I'm very sorry that we can't offer you coffee but for those who are in the building um, coffee and refreshments will be served in the north transept which is in that direction I won't try and do left and right um, 
but you are all very welcome. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ, hallelujah, hallelujah.